Does your company purchase assets that they expect to keep and use for more than one year? Well, then you need to learn all about depreciation. But what is depreciation anyway? If you have any questions about this topic, you can leave them in the comments section below and I'll do my best to help you. And of course, if you feel the video helped you, I hope you will click like and don't forget to subscribe to get updates on new videos that come out all the time. Now you may well ask, what is depreciation? Well, the word depreciation is a noun and it means the amount of decrease in value of an asset that happens over time. The verb to depreciate is what we are doing when we record the decrease in value of an asset over time. You see, there's two kinds of depreciation. There's the type of depreciation that happens when an asset is no longer needed or desired, and that's not the type of depreciation that we account for when we keep books and records of a company. We are instead talking about the type of decrease in value that happens to the asset as you use it or use up the resource that the asset represents. You see, when an asset is no longer needed or desired, that condition is called obsolescence or the asset has become obsolete. And that means that an asset is less desired and therefore less valuable. For example, you can buy a beautiful house worth a lot of money and rest assured that if a week after you purchase the house they open up a nuclear power plant just two blocks down the road, you can be sure that the asset value will decrease. But that's not the type of decrease we're talking about. You can't control a nuclear power plant being built next to the house that you lived in for 20 years. You can't predict it regardless of how you actually use the house or the asset. And that's the reason why we do not use this thing called market value. You see, the market value of an asset is what people would be willing to pay for it at any given moment. And we know that it's volatile. So we do not use the market value of the asset when we record things in our accounting records. You see, the market value changes, but not related to the business operations. And if there's no relationship between using the asset and using up the value, then we really can't record the depreciation in our records because then when we look at the resulting financial statements, it won't really be a reflection of how much of the asset we used. It'll only be a reflection of how much people are willing to pay. And that won't really help a person when judging how well a company is doing and utilizing their assets to run the company. And that's why that type of depreciation is not what we're talking about when we record depreciating assets. We instead use something called historical cost. Only record what you actually paid for the asset or to extend the life of the asset. That's what it means to record assets under historical cost. That does reflect a change in value as you use the asset. And it's the only legitimate way to compare financial statements between two different time periods. So let's explore using the idea of historical cost together. You see, when an asset value is being used up, you can picture the asset diminishing as you use it and the amount of the asset you use over time becomes the expense. Just like we learned in the prior video. For example, supplies are an asset at the moment you buy them because at the moment you buy them, you have something of value you can use into the future. Then as you use the supplies, the amount of supplies that gets used up 
becomes the amount of supplies expense that you record. Same thing with prepaid rent like we learned in the prior video. When you first pay rent, you have something of value that you can use into the future. You have the right to use the space that you rented. But as time goes by, the amount of time that you rented for is being used up, and the amount that's used up becomes the rent expense that you report on your profit and loss. Now of the three examples here, the clearest one is when supplies becomes supplies expense. You see, at the moment you purchase the office supplies, like pens and paper clips and so on, you have them, you own them, they are assets at the moment you buy them because you can use them into the future. Then, as you use the supplies, the money you paid for the specific supplies that you use is the amount that becomes supplies expense on the next monthly profit and loss. You see, the remaining supplies still have value as of the balance sheet date. So whatever the money value is of what you paid for, for the supplies that you still have, should be the balance of the asset account supplies at the end of the month. And the amount that you report as supplies expense is the amount you actually used during the time period of the profit and loss or income statement and it's the actual amount expended or used and that makes for accurate financial statements that give a true picture of what's happening in the business and how well it runs now this is the same idea for fixed assets a fixed asset is an asset that you expect to have for more than one year it can be things like a company car or a company truck, or it can be the office furniture that you buy and expect to use in the office for many years. It can even be a restaurant that owns a big freezer that they're going to use over many years to operate the restaurant. The idea is all the same. It's the idea of an asset being used up over time and becoming an expense. And the example asset, or should I say, the example fixed asset that we're going to use in this case is a car. You see, we know that a car only has a certain number of drivable miles that you can actually drive or use during the life of the car. And we all know that the more miles you drive in the car, the more you use up or depreciate the value. And the expense that represents a fixed asset decreasing over time is depreciation expense. So it's still the same idea of an asset losing value over time as you use it. And the important part that we learned in prior video chapters is that we record these in the T accounts in the chart of accounts. We know that the asset supplies represents the physical supplies that we still have on hand. And we know that as we use the supplies over time, only the specific supplies that we use become the supplies expense and the money amount of what we used gets recorded as a debit to the supplies expense and a credit to the asset supplies. You see, we have less of the asset supplies and that's why we make a credit to decrease the value. And therefore, the value is lower on the next balance sheet and only reflects what we paid for the remaining supplies. We then, of course, debit the supplies expense account only for the amount that was actually used or used up during the time period that the income statement or profit and loss is reporting on. And that's the amount that will show on the income statement or profit and loss. And since the idea is the same, we can make T accounts that represent the car and depreciation expense, except in this case, What's being used over time is the drivable miles of the car at the moment that you buy the car. 
You see, a car only comes with a certain number of drivable miles that you can physically drive as you use the car in the future to run the business. And as you drive the miles over time, whatever miles you drive, or let's say the cost associated with whatever miles you drive will decrease the value of the car in your books and records and those miles or the cost associated with those miles will become the depreciation expense that you report on your profit and loss during the time period that you actually drove those miles using the car. And of course, as you drive the car over time, there are fewer miles available in the future to drive the car, and that's why you would credit the asset to lower the value exactly the way that we learned in the prior example and the prior video. That makes a lower balance on the balance sheet to represent what the car is worth when someone looks at the value of the car on the balance sheet. And of course, the actual miles expended or used up, or let's say the cost associated with the miles that were expended or used up, go as a debit to the depreciation expense account to show the amount that you will put on the profit and loss as the amount of expense associated with lowering the value of the car. But then the question is, how do you record it in your books and records at the end of each period? Well, the idea is exactly the same as what it was when we used supplies in our previous example. We would make a normal monthly adjustment to adjust for the decrease in value of the asset and to acknowledge the amount that was expended during this period we would have to make a credit to the asset account to lower the value and we would make a debit to the depreciation expense to show how much was used or the cost associated with whatever was used up during that accounting period. Part 2, how much depreciation to record. If you want to know how much depreciation to record, you first ask yourself how much of the car did you use? And when we ask that question, we're talking about the money value of the amount of car you used regarding the miles that you're able to drive. So how do you calculate and credit adjustment for depreciation? Well, the first important new phrase that we will learn regarding finding out how much to debit and credit for the depreciation adjustment is the phrase useful life. You see useful life means how many years will the asset give service and produce value that we can use in our business. And in the case of the car it means how many miles will the car be drivable and produce valuable services that the business can use. Now, how do you calculate and find useful life? Well, first you have to figure out how much of the car did you use. Now, what does that mean? Well, you have to use a logical comparison to determine during any period of time how much of the car you actually used. And logically, the way we do this is we compare how many miles you actually drove this particular accounting period whether it's a month a fiscal quarter or a year and we compare that many miles that we actually used to how many miles you could have driven if you completely used up all of the useful miles in the car by logically comparing this you can figure out how much of the car you used and then mathematically what's the money amount of the car that you used during the period. That's your depreciation adjustment. So useful life you should know is always an estimate based on past data and past statistics.
If you buy a car, it's not going to be exactly the numbers uh, in miles they predict, but based on past services and past information about that car, you should be able to estimate the useful life in miles pretty accurately. For example, for example, let's imagine on January 1 of 2025, we purchased a car for $10,000. And let's imagine that the estimated useful life on this car is 10,000 drivable miles in its lifetime. Well, how would we record the purchase? We already learned how to do that in prior videos with simple debits and credits. If we paid cash, then we would credit cash 10,000 because the asset cash decreases and we would debit the car 10,000 for the amount that we paid for the car and that would reflect the value of the car in our books. Now, continuing in the same example, let's discuss the difference between how much we could drive and how much we did drive. How do we find that out? Well, we know we paid $10,000 for the car. And we know that there's 10,000 drivable miles that we can drive during the life of this car before we have to scrap it. Therefore, we could consider the money value of every mile driven to be $1 per mile. That means that the value of the car from the point of view of someone who is using the car, not planning on selling it, the value of the car decreases $1 every time a mile is driven. That's in theory. That's the idea of depreciation based on usage. So, in theory, each mile you drive, you use or expend $1 of the value from the original purchase. That means that we have to then use that one dollar per mile to figure out the monthly adjustment amount and if we know that we lose one dollar in value every time a mile is driven then what we need to do is look on the odometer and see how many miles have been driven since the last accounting period so let's imagine on january 31 the odometer on the car shows 500 miles have been driven during the first month of using the car. And if it's $1 per mile that we figured out a moment ago, that means in theory you expended or used up $500 worth of car or let's say accumulated $500 worth of depreciation on the car for driving it 500 miles. So then what would we do? We would have to debit depreciation expense car for the monthly adjustment amount and that's the expense that would show up on the profit and loss to show how much of the car's value was used during that period. And of course the balancing credit would go towards the asset so that the net amount would show up on the balance sheet as the actual value of the car reflected in drivable miles. In other words, there would be 9,500 remaining drivable miles in money value as of the date of the balance sheet. And of course, $500 of depreciation expense is the money value of the actual driven miles and that would show on that particular period, in this case January's, profit and loss as depreciation expense. Now let's do a different example so the numbers are not as round. For example, let's imagine instead on January 1 we purchased a car for 15,000 and in this case the estimated useful life is 30,000 drivable miles in its lifetime. So therefore the first thing we need to do is calculate the cost per mile in theory regarding the purchase cost and how many miles we can use. So if we paid $15,000 to be able to drive 30,000 miles, that means in theory, 
each time we drive a mile, we are using up 50 cents out of the 15,000 that we paid for the car because the reason that we paid 15,000 is to be able to drive 30,000 miles to use the car for our business. But what would be the monthly adjustment amount in this case? We know the car in this example would start off with a $30,000 debit balance. But in order to know the monthly adjustment amount, we would have to again look on the odometer and see how many miles were driven during the specific month that we are preparing our financial statements for. And we see in this example that we drove the car 1,450 miles during January. And if it costs us 50 cents in value every time we drive the car, it means we have expended or used up $725 of what we paid for the car during January. So that's the amount of depreciation expense that we would record. And again, we always debit depreciation expense for the value that was expended or used up and we always, in theory, credit the asset so that when we get the net value of the asset, we can see that the remaining drivable miles in money value as of the balance sheet date shows up as the balance of the car. And of course, only the money value of the miles that were driven or expended and used during the period will show up as depreciation expense for that particular month's profit and loss. And now, part three of our little depreciation story, the three common methods of calculating depreciation adjustment amounts. You see, we actually learned one way already. Our first example with the car is the example of the unit of production method. You see, this method is depreciation based on usage. You would first divide the total purchase cost of the asset by how many units in the useful life. This will give you the depreciation amount per unit. Like we did with the car, when we divided the total purchase cost of the car by the estimated number of miles that the car could be driven in its useful life. That gave us the cost per mile, but if it's another asset, it's cost per unit. You then multiply the unit amount by how many units were used, or in the case of the car, driven during this specific accounting period, and that would give you the money amount of the adjustment to debit the depreciation expense and lower the value of the asset. That's the one that we already did, and you can go back and look at that and apply that to any kind of asset, whether it's a car or a piece of manufacturing equipment or anything you needed. The second common method of calculating the amount of depreciation expense is called the straight line method. And it's called the straight line method because every year has the same amount of depreciation for the asset. This method is based on the time that you spent using the asset. You divide the purchase cost of what you paid by the total number of years in its useful life. That's the amount of depreciation each year if you make an annual depreciation adjustment. And if you report monthly, then you divide the annual amount you found by 12. And the third method of calculating depreciation is called accelerated depreciation. It's when you record more depreciation expense in the early years of the asset and less in the later years. In Accounting 101, we learn some number trick patterns that we use to calculate more depreciation in the early years of the asset's useful life and less depreciation expense in the later years of the asset's useful life. And for taxes, it helps us deduct more depreciation expense in the early years if we choose to. And then this will help the business save on taxes 
and until, until it can grow and get strong. Now let's do an example of straight line depreciation. Let's imagine on January 1, we purchased a $50,000 truck with the estimated useful life of 10 years. Of course, the truck will have a $50,000 debit balance in the asset account after you purchased it. But what's the annual adjustment amount that you have to record? Well, if you paid $50,000 for a truck that you're able to use for 10 years, then in theory, you're using up $5,000 of the $50,000 that you paid every year that you continue to drive the truck. So then how do you record the annual adjustment? Well, of course, it would be debit depreciation expense $5,000 and credit the truck $5,000, just like we learned in the prior example. However, that's not the proper way to record and display the depreciation adjustment or the depreciation against the truck. You see, of course we have to debit the depreciation expense account 5000 because this shows the value that was used during the period and that expense will go with the rest of the expenses on the profit and loss. But the balance in credit does not go directly to the asset account. Instead, the balancing $5,000 credit goes to another account that's connected to the truck account. And instead of putting the credit directly to the truck, we put a credit to this account here. And it's called accumulated depreciation. And accumulated depreciation is a T account in the chart of accounts that only exists to be able to hold the amount of depreciation that has accumulated on any asset so you can compare it to the actual asset cost. Now this is your first introduction to the idea of something called a contra account. You see a contra account is an account that exists only to decrease another existing account. So these two accounts go together. They must be shown together on the financial statements or they mean nothing. You can think of them like conjoined accounts where you can't have one without the other and you must present both of them together so someone looking at the financial statements can see how much you paid compared to the theoretical value of the amount that was used. So if you look at the fixed assets section of a balance sheet, you will see three numbers for every asset that you have to depreciate. Because looking at only one number is not really enough information for people looking at your financial position to really understand the value of the truck as it relates to how the company uses the truck for business. But if you display all three numbers together, that will give the reader of the financial statements a whole picture of the value of the truck as an asset in the company. And you may well ask, what happens the second year that you depreciate? Well, we know that each year's depreciation amount is 5000 so no matter what, at the end of each year, even the second year, we have to make a debit to depreciation expense to show the value of the truck that was used up during only the second year. But after you make the debit to depreciation expense, again, the balancing credit goes to the conjoined account, accumulated depreciation on the truck. And that's why they call it accumulated depreciation because now a second year's depreciation has accumulated and that means the total decrease in value since we purchased the truck was 10,000 against the 50,000 that we purchased and at the end of the second year the amount of accumulated depreciation in the account 
would show up in the fixed asset section as 10,000 and therefore if the depreciation was 5,000 more that means the second year the book value would be 5,000 less so this shows the reader we purchased the truck at 50,000 but 10,000 out of the 50,000 has been used as we use the truck in business and therefore the real value of the truck is forty thousand dollars so simply put more accumulated depreciation means a lower book value for the truck shown on the next periods balance sheet and this was a pretty simple example because each year's depreciation was the same amount but what about accelerated depreciation how would you handle it in that case well Accelerated depreciation means that you record more depreciation in early years and less depreciation in later years. You notice the overall amount of depreciation is the same, but you get to deduct more expense in earlier years when your business might need the deduction more. So there are two common methods of accelerated depreciation. One is called some of the years digits and the other one is called double declining balance and they're both under generally accepted accounting principles when you report your financial statements they're both very simply number patterns that give us a depreciation table that tells us how much depreciation to deduct each year where the numbers at the beginning of the table for the earlier years are higher and the numbers at the end of the table for the later years are lower and this makes the more depreciation expense in the earlier years and less in the later years. There's no point in getting into them now. They're simply elementary school number tricks that you can find from your textbook. Part 4. Depreciation records for taxes. The IRS explains everything. The Internal Revenue Service makes available publication number 946 which explains everything about how to depreciate property and in this publication they give charts and tables that break down different type of fixed assets into categories and these categories are called class life and if you can look up the type of asset you have and find what class life the asset belongs to then you can use these columns and rows to make a separate depreciation schedule for each asset you see the way it works is that some property falls under three-year property in that category things like some cars but then there's other property that's considered five-year property like farm equipment and so on so you would first look up in the tables which category or how many years it would take to depreciate that specific asset then once you do that you would then make a separate depreciation schedule based on the category of that asset for example if the company car was three-year property then you would use the three-year column numbers to make the full schedule and the only reason for the full schedule is to be able to see how much depreciation you will deduct for that specific asset for each of the years of the assets life so the numbers for each individual tax schedule for each asset come from the tables in the publication from the IRS this is an example of three-year property and this is what this schedule would look like if it were five-year property like some farm equipment then again the schedule for that piece of equipment would come from the column of five-year property and that's what that would look like if it cost ten thousand to purchase and here are two separate depreciation schedules for two separate example fixed assets and the way to find total depreciation expense for the year would be to use the amount of depreciation for the specific year for each asset for example 
let's imagine that this is the second year of using the equipment. So we would look on the second row and deduct the amount that the schedule indicates as the depreciation expense for the second year for this specific fixed asset. But let us also imagine in this same year that it's actually the third year using the company car. So we would look in the row of the third year of depreciation to determine how much depreciation expense we should have for the car. And if these were the only two fixed assets in this example company, that means you would add them together and total depreciation expense in this example would be 7,242. Many companies only have one fixed asset account for all their assets and for all their depreciation. And if that were the case, then the 7,242 would go as a debit to one specific account, depreciation expense, and the balancing credit would go to one specific account, accumulated depreciation on all fixed assets. You could have a separate set of uh, T accounts for each individual fixed asset, but many companies lump them together and use the separate depreciation schedules to keep track of them separately from year to year.